All right, so carbonyl chemistry last time, we left to thinking about this reaction in which we wanted to take a carboxylic acid and convert it into a methyl ester. We can use other ethers, but a, esters, but a methyl ester is the one we picked here. And we thought, well, let's see, this is a reaction that's occurring at the carbonyl. We start with a carbonyl, we end up with a carbonyl. So that must mean this is a carbonyl substitution reaction. So the OH group is going to get replaced by OCH3, and we were in the process of picking what kinds of nucleophiles we might use. First, we talked about methanol as the nucleophile. But methanol has a problem in that it is not a great nucleophile, and a carboxylic acid has pretty good resonance that would have to be overcome on the first nucleophilic attack. So that doesn't work too terribly well. That doesn't work as written. So then we said, let's make a better nucleophile, which would be methoxide. Better nucleophile than methanol because the oxygen has a formal negative charge. And would that make the, S, the same ester? Well, certainly the nucleophilic attack could occur, but the issue here is in addition to being a good nucleophile, methoxide is also a good base, which is going to be a problem with this particular functional group, which is a carboxylic acid. And somebody asked on the discussion board, by the way, why I say acid. It's not a local dialect or anything. It's not because you know, I'm from Rhode Island. In fact, I'm not from Rhode Island. I'm from outside of Philadelphia. The reason I say carboxylic acid is because I want to remind you of its acidic properties. Right? Methanol is in not much of an acid. Carboxylic acid is an acid. Sulfuric acid is acid. That's how we remember. But this is a carboxylic acid. And what happens when you take an acid and you have it in the presence of a strong base? You get deprotonation. So instead of the nucleophilic attack, that's what we'd like to happen. That doesn't. Instead, we get deprotonation. That's what does happen. Once you make the carboxylate out of that, Once you get the carboxylate, you get feedback from the microphone, and that's why the reaction can't proceed. <laughs> Don't write that on the exam. No, once you do this, you're up to a carboxylate, which is even more resistant to nucleophilic attack because it's got very good resonance and has a formal negative charge. So this doesn't work. Making the nucleophile better doesn't work. So we've, then we said, let's make the electrophile better. And we talked about making the electrophile better by putting a proton on the carbonyl oxygen. That will make the carbonyl oxygen even more electron demanding than it normally is, and that will make a much larger delta plus. Is that me feeding back or you? Everybody always blames me. I know why it is, because the wire here is taut. That should solve it. All right. so. <clears throat> The protonated carbonyl has a much larger, the oxygen has a much larger demand on the carbon than if it's not protonated, so we have a much larger delta plus there should be more susceptible to nucleophilic attack. So how do we do that? How do we put a proton on? Well, we need to modify our reaction. Methanol, again, is the solvent, but now we need a proton source. And to protonate a carbonyl, you need acid, strong acid, things like H2SO4. So the question is, will this combination give us the ester? So we started working out the mechanism. Now in our reaction, we have sulfuric acid and methanol and the carboxylic acid. And as it turns out, the methanol is simply the stronger base. It's not a great base, but it is a stronger base than the carboxylic acid. So the sulfuric acid is going to protonate the methanol first, and then the protonated methanol will put the proton on the carbonyl. So start with protonating methanol. And then the protonated methanol. We'll protonate the carbonyl.
Now you may already begin to see what the methanol is doing here. It is shuttling the proton around. We said last time that a number of carbonyl mechanisms have a small molecule like water or methanol, something like that, that shuttles the proton around. And here's another example of that. We also talked last time about why we put the proton on the carbonyl oxygen instead of the OH oxygen. Not because we simply want it to be there. Not because we said, I, that's why I want the proton, so that's where it goes. Because things don't always work that way. How many times in your life have you said, I want something, and it didn't happen? Right? When you were two and you stomped your feet because you wanted a bicycle for Christmas or a pony, did you get one? No. And no matter how much you stomped your feet, you still didn't get a pony. Probably the more you stomped your feet, the less you got a pony. I want a pony. Well, it doesn't work that way. It's not what you want, it's what Mother Nature wants. Now it turns out putting the proton on the carbonyl oxygen is easier than putting the proton on the OH oxygen because putting the proton on the carbonyl oxygen, as we saw last time, leads to an oxonium ion that has resonance delocalization of its positive charge, not if we put it on the OH. So it goes where we want it to go. That's good. Mother Nature is going to cooperate with us. Now what are we going to do next? That's the point where we were last time. Hint. This is a carbonyl substitution reaction. And there is one mechanism step that every single carbonyl substitution reaction has, and that is nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl. So when in doubt, let's do that. Now I also want to point out another way, to remind you of another way to think about doing mechanisms. You can do mechanisms with what I kind of call the bond change inventory. And that is you look where you currently are, which is this protonated carbonyl, where you need to get to, this is the ester we're trying to make, and think about the bond changes you have to make to get there. We have to get rid of one, in this case, one of these, both of these protons, and one of these oxygens has to become OCH3. So think about logical ways to do that. And one of, one of the choices that we have in carbonyls is nucleophilic attack. Now, granted, not a great nucleophile, methanol, but We've got more electrophilicity at the carbonyl carbon because we protonated it. So let's see where that goes. Oxygen here now has a positive charge because it started as neutral and it gave some electrons away. The carbonyl oxygen becomes a single bond at OH, but it's neutral because of the pair of electrons that used to be the pi bond now become the property of that oxygen. Okay, so this, what is the name of this beast? This is the tetrahedral intermediate. SP2 carbonyl carbon becomes SP3 carbon, tetrahedral intermediate. What's a tetrahedral intermediate like to do? Kick out leaving groups. Let's see what our leaving group choices are. Benzene ring? Never ever. OH? Do you see an oxyanionic tetrahedral intermediate? Remember what the rule was? It has to be a negatively charged tetrahedral intermediate to kick out an O minus. No negative charges here. O minus, OH minus can't leave. So OH minus can't leave. Methanol. That's the best leaving group. So this tends to go backwards. That doesn't mean the mechanism never moves forward. It just means that the methanol is frequently leaving. Okay, so uh, ejection of a leaving group isn't going to move the mechanism forward, so what else do we need to do? Again, bond change inventory. What do we need to do? One of these OHs needs to go away. Another OH needs to become a carbonyl. And down here, we need to get rid of the proton and the positive charge. We have three things to do. Do we necessarily have to do one first? Right? When you have homework to do, at the end of the day, when you go back to your dorm room and you say, hmm, I have to do Chem 14D and math and physics, let's say. You have to do them all. It doesn't really matter what order you do them in. Usually, right, you just pick one and do it. Well, sometimes that's the way it works here. We pick one and do it. See, see what happens. Now, there is one guiding principle we should pay attention to, and that's we're talking about getting rid of an OH, and we can't get rid of an OH... Uh, we can't get rid of OH minus because this isn't negatively charged. So we might protonate one of the OHs to make it leave, but then that's going to put a positive charge. And then we'll have two positive charges close to each other. That's bad. We want to avoid that. So with that thought in mind, what should we do? 
Deprotonate? Okay, fair enough. What, what, and what, what should we deprotonate and what do we deprotonate with? You want to deprotonate the O plus? Why not deprotonate one of these guys? When you're, doing, when you're taking a proton away, so when this molecule is going to be an acid, if this molecule was just molecule X and it had two protons, call them A and B, we would take proton A away because proton A is the most acidic, right? Do the most acidic protons first. It's like if you have bases around, use the strongest base. If you have acids, use the strongest acid. So which proton in this molecule, OH, OH, or OH+, plus, which one of those is, wants to be taken away? Which one's most acidic? The OH+, plus, right? Taking that away gives, neutralizes a positive charge. Okay, that's the acidic proton. What should I deprotonate it with? I need a base. How about hydroxide? That's a good base. Should I use hydroxide? No, it's not present. I can only use what's present. What is the strongest base that's present in my reaction? Methanol. Methanol is a strong, certainly by sulfate, the conjugate base we get from this, which I haven't written, this is a lousy base. Very, very strong acid, very lousy base. So methanol is better than bisulfate. Methanol also turns out to be a stronger base than the carboxylic acid. So we're going to use methanol to do this deprotonation. And that makes protonated methanol again. What's the methanol doing again? It's the proton bus. It took, it took a proton away, it dropped a proton off, now it's picking up a proton. All right, what do we do next? Bond change inventory. Here we have this thing with a benzene ring, two OHs and OCH3. What changes do we need to make? One of these OHs has to go away. Another OH has to become the carbonyl. And the OCH3 we don't have to do anything to. So what should we do? Protonate OH, you want to protonate an OH, why, do you, why an OH? Why not protonate this oxygen? Because that's, it's happening, it's just not productive. Why not protonate the benzene ring? Because it would disrupt aromaticity, plus there's nothing that changes in the benzene ring in our mechanism, so chances are we're not doing anything out there. So protonate an OH. Should I protonate the 12 o'clock OH or the 3 o'clock OH? It was your suggestion, so you have to pick. Is it polite to answer a question with a question? <laughs> Your question, though, is correct. It doesn't matter. They're both OHs. Just because one's pointing up and just because one's pointing up and one's pointing to the right, doesn't matter. So I'm just going to use this guy here. What the heck? Since you told me to put the proton on and I just did it blindly, is there some reason why you wanted me to put the proton on there? Yeah, so the water can leave. We need one of these OHs to leave, but it cannot leave as OH minus because this isn't negatively charged. So we make it into a better leaving group. Now what do you think we should do next? Here's a way to think about it. Imagine you're in a relationship that you want to get out of. So while the other person in that relationship is gone to work or school or whatever, you pack their bags, put them outside the front door to the apartment, and change the lock on the apartment. So when they come home, they rattle the door and go, Honey, I can't get in. I want dinner. They're not getting the hint, right? You've packed their bags. Now they should leave. So that's the point. You put the proton on because you wanted it to leave, so now let's have it leave. And now we have a molecule of water. Now at this point, you should be going, aha, I know what to do, because this thing is called a Carbocation and 
Every time you see a carbocation reaction mechanism, regardless where it comes from, the first thing we think about is resonance. Now, here's another reason for people who have been asking, why do we think about resonance? Is because of this. Let's just draw a resonance structure, a resonance contributor. Let's say this one. And suddenly, things are clear in principle. The reason I'm saying that is because this is now one step away from the product, the product we want. So another reason we think about resonance, especially in carbonyl mechanisms, is because resonance will often lead us in the right direction to the logical conclusion. What do we have to do? Here, here's the product we, want, we wanted to make. That ester, what do we have to do to finish this up? Deprotonate. What should I deprotonate with? Well, I could use water or methanol. They're about equal basicity. I'm going to use methanol. It doesn't really matter. So there is our product, the ester, plus the protonated methanol. Since we have made the protonated methanol in the last step, and we use it back here in the beginning of the mechanism, that tells us the protonated methanol is a catalyst. Now you might say, wait a minute, how can it be a catalyst? Because it's not present in the stuff we mixed up. We took carboxylic acid and sulfuric acid and methanol. I don't see any protonated methanol there. Remember, catalyst doesn't have to be something you added in the beginning. It could be something you've generated in the process of the reaction. So it's not the H2SO4 that's the catalyst here. Really, it's the protonated methanol. Although we, because we only have to use a little bit of catalyst, we only have to use a little bit of H2SO4 to generate the catalyst. So this process is catalyzed. You'll also notice perhaps something else about this process. I can take an ester, like a carboxylic acid, and protonate the carbonyl. And if I think about the carbonyl as having this particular resonance contributor, every time you see a carbocation, yada, 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 capture a molecule of water. We can do some proton transfers. In other words, the whole thing is completely reversible. Let me write that. Now, I'm going to write the whole reverse mechanism, of course. I'm just going to write the reverse reaction. Ow. So in a more generic sense, we can take the carboxylic acid and a molecule of alcohol, I'll just call it R prime, and that is going to be in equilibrium with the corresponding ester and a molecule of water. It takes acid to go in both directions. So acid to go in the forward direction, H plus in quotes, because we can't have naked protons. It just simply means some sort of acid, and acid to go backwards. Now, first of all, let's talk about the position of this equilibrium. Is this an issue? I mean, if we wanted to make ester, could we just mix up some carboxylic acid and ethanol and expect pretty much all the carboxylic acid to be converted to the ester or not? So what's the, equi what's the equilibrium constant here? Is it significantly greater than 1? Is it approximately equal to 1, or does it lie very much to the left? Remember, we talked about position of equilibrium. It's based upon stability, and the principal stability issue is going to be resonance. No resonance here, no resonance here, but there's resonance in a carboxylic acid. There's resonance in an ester, which has more significant resonance. Or are they equal? They're pretty much equal. They're both carbonyls with an oxygen next door. And the R group usually doesn't change the nature of that. So this equilibrium constant, very close to equal. Now, if you're trying to make the ester and you want to be efficient about it in the laboratory, that's a problem. So what do we do? If we want to make lots of ester, we say, hey, Le Chatelier, help us out. And he says, in his accent, which I can't do today, he says, it's like some bad French accent. 
which I can't do. Can you do a bad French accent? No? What did Le Chatelier say? If you have an equilibrium and you want to shift it to one side, what do you do? You either take stuff away from the side you want to shift it to, or you add lots of stuff to the side you're trying to move it away from. So in other words, I can shift this equilibrium towards the ester by doing one of several things. I can use lots of carboxylic acid or I can use lots of alcohol. Now, it turns out for practical reasons, we generally use lots of alcohol. Or, once I make the ester, I can remove water as it's formed. Either one of those will shift the equilibrium towards the ester. Now, if I, want, if I have the ester and I want the carboxylic acid, I want to hydrolyze the ester this direction, then I can use an excess of water or I can take away the carboxylic acid and or the alcohol as it's formed. So we can adjust that equilibrium. Now, in the laboratory, it may not necessarily be that easy, but on paper, we're going to assume that we have control over it. So when we write this reaction, we can make it go either direction. The forward version of this reaction, uh, carboxylic acid plus lots of alcohol with a little acid catalyst is actually was developed by somebody whose name you re may recognize. It's called the Fischer esterification. This is the same Fisher who won his Nobel Prize around 1908, I think it was, around then. That Fisher ring a bell to anybody? I'm sorry? This is the Fisher of Fisher projections. This is the Fisher of I'm going to figure out the structure of all the uh, mono, or all the, all the monosaccharides, the aldoses is what he did. He was also involved with figuring out some of the initial ideas about DNA structure, figuring out what the purine and pyrimidine bases look like. Considered by some, Emil Fisher, to be the preeminent chemist of his time, certainly maybe the most preeminent organic chemist of all time, that's arguable, but nonetheless named after him. The reverse process, where we're going backwards, is just a hydrolysis, right? Remember, breaking water breaking hydrolysis. We're taking the ester and hydrolyzing it. Now, we haven't written the ester hydrolysis mechanism, but I encourage you to do that. It's good practice to work it out. All right. Now, let's move away from Mr. Fisher here, here, Professor Fisher, and talk about a different carbonyl reaction. We're going to talk about aldehyde going to imine. And I hope you will quickly see why this particular functional group conversion is important. Here is a kind of a generic example. We're going to take a primary amine, which is sticking out of a protein, it's actually a lysine side chain, sticking out of a protein called opsin, and we're going to add that to an aldehyde, which has a whole bunch of double bonds down here, i.e. it's conjugated, and this particular aldehyde is called retinal, and when these guys go together, protein squiggly for the rest of the molecule there. So this thing right here, the carbon-nitrogen double bond, is the imine. And this particular imine it has a name. It is rhodopsin. So does anybody see why this is important? This is what's going on in here. You are using this reaction in here to see this, re well, to see what I've written on the board. So this is part of your visual protein apparatus. When retinol comes along, it binds to make rhodopsin. And the fact that retinol is conjugated means this imine is now conjugated. Rhodopsin is conjugated. And it is the conjugated portion that absorbs the visible light, which starts the whole process which is kind of complicated, to signal to your brain that says, hey, brain, I've seen a photon. We're not interested in the I've seen a photon portion. I want to know about this formation of the imine. Now, we're going to do this. We're going to talk about this process. And, of course, there are enzymes that are involved in this. We're going to talk about this from a very simple point of view. I'm going to do a simpler version of this. We don't need all the extra spinach because it doesn't really change anything. So for our simple example, let's do methylamine and benzaldehyde. 
about as simple an aldehyde and amine as you can get. And if we can see in our reaction, what happens here is the carbonyl of the aldehyde becomes the nitrogen of the amine. So when we put those guys together, we're going to have CH3N with a hydrogen there and a phenyl there. So that's what we're going to have. Now it also turns out we're going to use some water for this as well because we need a proton shuttle. All right, let's figure out what is mechanism. Where should we start? Well, we have three things, water, aldehyde, and amine. And amine is, is, a good, is a better nucleophile than water. It's not a stellar react with anything kind of nucleophile, but it's, it's okay. And aldehydes, well, those are among the most electrophilic of all the carbonyl-containing compounds we've talked about. So maybe that's a good place to start. But even before we start there, let's ask a broader question. Is this an addition reaction or a substitution reaction? I'm asking that because it involves a carbonyl. The carbonyl is clearly reacting, and we said that these reactions all fall in either the addition or the substitution category. Now, this one's a little bit harder to think about. Is this a, remember we said nucleophilic carbonyl substitution? You start with a carbonyl, you end up with a carbonyl. Is this a substitution reaction? No, because we don't end up with a carbonyl. In an addition reaction, you start with a carbonyl and, the, and you end up with an sp3 carbon. Is that happening here? Nope. I will tell you that this will look like an addition reaction until we get to the very end when there's just simply a leaving group leaving. So you can think about it in either way, really. But it will have the same kind of generic steps that we've been talking about. So let's start with nucleophilic addition to the carbonyl. There's our nucleophilic addition. You might be saying, but why aren't we starting by protonating the carbonyl? We did that in the Fischer esterification mechanism. Well, there's no strong acid present. So we don't even need to think about that. All right, let's see here. O minus H, N, H, H, C, H, 3, plus. Tetrahedral immediate, negative charge on the oxygen. Are we bored of that yet? Tetrahedral immediate negative charge on the oxygen, what do we do? We've forgotten already. Bree, how many times have we done this so far? Four or five. Four or five. How many more times are we going to do it? I can't count. I can't count. Big number. Every time you see a tetrahedral intermediate with a negative charge on the oxygen, it has a to-do list. There's two things on its to-do list and only two things, and it's the same things are always on its to-do list. And one of those things is always on the top of the to-do list because it does it first. It's like me when I get out of bed in the morning, there's two things on my to-do list. Feed the cats, make coffee. If I try to make coffee before I feed the cats, they will let me know and get in the way. So the cats get fed first. I mean, I do other things as well, you know, you don't need to know about my personal habits, but those are things that need to be done. But one thing always gets done first. So with tetrahedral intermediates to the negative charge on the oxygen, the one thing that always gets done first is, please don't say feed the cats. Eject a leaving group. What are our leaving group choices? Benzene ring. Never, ever, never leaves. Hydrogen or hydride. Hint, this is not the chi chi Bobbin reaction. When it's the chi chi bobbin reaction, I will write on the board, chi chi bobbin reaction. So that's not leaving. That leaves the amine. Could the amine leave? Yeah, it's the best leaving group that's here. It can go backwards. So that means that this is very reversible, but it doesn't help us. So when a tetrahedral intermediate can't kick out a leaving group, what do we do next? Go back to, if you have your lecture supplement with you, you have a big red box or a yellow box, or a pink box, or whatever color it is that you made, but a box that says tetrahedral intermediate, you do nucleophilic attack, get a tetrahedral intermediate, and there's this little branch thing that says substitution or addition. Substitution doesn't happen immediately here because there's no leaving group to leave that'll move it forward, so the other thing that happens is? Have you ever tried to start a car on a cold morning? Right, you put the key in the ignition, and now people are looking it up. All right. You put the key in the ignition, and the car goes. Nah, 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 nah. 
you find it? Except the proton, thank you. Which page is that on, just so everybody can look it up if they have their pink book? 49, big pink box, or do you have a pink box, or a, is it a yellow box, or what the color did you put? Black. It's bl that black works, all right, but it's a box. All right, so except the proton, which we protonate it with. The strongest acid that's present is? Well, there's actually a stronger acid that's present. And ammonium salt's a stronger acid. So you might say, ah, let's just do this. But we're not allowed to do that, remember? That's when Mother Nature says it's pretty, but it's wrong. You can't do these one, three shifts. We can't take that directly. But if you can't take it directly and still need to move that proton away, you use the bus. What is the bus, do you think? Water works for the bus. Now, it doesn't really matter whether I put the proton on the O minus or take it away from the NH plus first. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't. It doesn't. So I'm going to protonate the oxygen first, just because I'm in a let's protonate things first mood. Some people will say the way you can get around that decision as to what you protonate or deprotonate first, whether I put the proton on the O minus first or take the proton away from the NH plus first, which one do I do? They solve it by doing both simultaneously. So one water molecule is dropping off a proton at the same time one water molecule is picking up. Well, it's true that water is the proton bus or, and that you can think of multiple buses pulling into the bus station at the same time but it doesn't work here. You can't have three molecules banging into each other simultaneously. It's only two molecules at a time. So put the proton on the O minus. Now what should I do? Bond, change, inventory. What do we need to do? This is where we are. I'm trying to get up to this imine. So let's see, the OH needs to go away. That hydrogen is still there. The nitrogen is there, except it needs to lose two hydrogens and a positive charge. What shall I do? Deprotonate? What should I deprotonate? Uh, like the NH, that's definitely, yeah, that's the most acidic proton that's here. That's true. What should I deprotonate it with? I'm going to use water. Water seems like a good choice. Deprotonate. Oh, and now I have some H3O plus I've just made. Now, by the way, you can also use the amine for the proton shuttle here as well. That's a stronger base, but it makes uh, a weaker acid. So you, you can also use it as well. All right, now what should I do? Bond change inventory. Need to get rid of OH, keep the H, keep the phenyl, make a CN double bond, keep the methyl, get rid of a hydrogen. A couple of things to do. What should I do? Protonate the, protonate the OH? Why should I protonate the OH? But the nitrogen is the most basic site in the molecule. Shouldn't I protonate the nitrogen? Shouldn't I protonate this? Takes me right back to where I was. That's happening. Right? Again, even though we say you should always use the strongest base and the strongest acid that are present, that's, try that first. But it's not necessarily always productive. It means that just because the amine is a stronger base than the OH doesn't mean that the amine always gets the proton. It just means it gets it most of the time here. It's probably about a 5 to 1 ratio or something, or excuse me, a 10 to the 5th ratio. So occasionally the OH gets protonated, but that will move things forward. Okay, what do I protonate the OH with? The strongest acid that's present, which is the H3O plus I just generated. Again, if you forget that this is here because you haven't written it, get in the habit of writing it if you need to do that. Protonate the alcohol. Here's our protonated alcohol. Now what should we do? Think back to what was here just before, I, actually it was right about here before I erased it. 
Did we not do exactly the same thing in the Fischer esterification mechanism? Protonated an OH, what did we do after we protonated the OH? It left. So let's have this leave. Remember we were talking about patterns? That's another common mechanism pattern you see in, in a lot of these things. Put a proton on an OH, then water leaves. All right, water leaves. The departure of water made a carbocation resonance, all right. Benzene ring resonance, that's certainly there. Turns out not to be productive, but it helps, helps the water leave because it's next to the benzene ring. But it's the nitrogen resonance that's actually going to be productive. And by the way, you don't have to draw curved arrows for resonance in the mechanism. I've just included it here. There we go. Now what do I do? Yeah, one step away from my imine. All I have to do is deprotonate. And that makes, I'll draw it up here for space. That makes our imine and H3O+. And you might, while you're at it, note that the imine nitrogen can be protonated to make a protonated imine or iminium ion, which has resonance, which is a carbocation, which might accept a molecule of water. You probably know where I'm going with this. All the way back to here. Like the Fischer esterification, this process is also reversible. It has the same equilibrium issue, so we have to kind of control it. And I'll encourage you to draw the backwards mechanism for practice. Now, is this process catalyzed with acid or not? Well, let's see. I made acid in, well, here's water, right? And I made acid in this step, and I got acid back in the end. So, yeah, this could be, you could argue it's catalyzed with water or acid, either one of those. And, of course, it's a reversible kind of thing. Now, one of the things you may have noticed in this, oh, a couple of things. First of all, you might say, wait a minute, carbocations are bad, are they not? They're, they have lots of anxiety, like a Mel Brooks movie, High Anxiety. Anybody know that movie? No? Anybody, have you, any of you know who Mel Brooks is? You haven't seen High Anxiety? The one where he's running a, a hospital for the something... Not criminally insane, but a mental institution. And he's called high anxiety because he himself has fear of heights. He's the disease, high anxiety. And he's at a place where people have lots of anxiety. It's a pun. <laughs> no? All right, never mind. Watch the movie. Um, but you might say, wait a minute, can't we avoid the carbocation? Because what we're doing here is the water is leaving and then the, le then the lone pair is coming along and making the, the carbocation feel happy. Could I just combine those? Could I just kind of use the lone pair to push out the water and get rid of the carbocation? In other words, I'm asking, can I combine water leaving with the, the residence, the lone pair res, residence. Is there a difference between this and what I've drawn over there? And the answer is no, there isn't. While what's written over there has extra arrows, more structures, it's exactly the same thing as this. Remember that resonance is simply an alternate way of drawing the same structure. It's not a mechanism step. It doesn't take time. It doesn't have a transition state. It doesn't have an energy of activation. It can never be a rate-determining step. This 
simply says, wait, 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 I'm going to take this molecule and draw it a different way. So I'm just combining the let's draw it a different way with the leaving group leaving. So that's a possibility. Now let's take that one step further in terms of combining. You might say then let's make more microphone noise. Then let's do this. So let's go back to where we had the protonated, the ammonium salt, the protonated amine, and do deprotonation, kick out the water, or excuse me, form the pi bond and kick out the water all at once. So that leads to the same place. And this is an E2 kind of process. I'll put it in quotes because it's not really E2 because it's not a whole mechanism. It's part of a mechanism. But it's E2-ish. Can I do this? What are the E2 requirements? Remember what E2 requires? Moderate or better leaving group. What kind of leaving group is water? Okay. I need... Moderate or better base, usually strong base actually for E2. Water is a lousy base, so that's a strike against it. I need the periplanar beta hydrogen, which I can easily get here. So the issue really becomes the base strength of water. Now, if you think of this as not really being E2, as being kind of more E1-ish or somewhere in between, then maybe you can rationalize it. Would we let you do this in an exam? Maybe. Better to avoid it, though, because water is a lousy base. It's not really E2-ish. This is fine, because this is just uh, water leaving and then resonance. That's cool, especially because the carbocation we would get, if you would draw it, would be really nice. So this, okay. This, well, let's just avoid that. All right, something else you may have noticed in all of this is some, well, or some other questions that kind of come up at this point. So let's answer a couple of Miscellaneous questions, bring up some pointers, etc. So we'll call this questions and pointers. We're going to address three issues here. The first one is a pattern issue. You might say, okay, I, I had a question about the Fisher esterification. Why, why doesn't it go further? In other words, when we took a ketone, and we reacted it with methanol. We can do the addition. That works fine. In the Fischer esterification mechanism, so we converted to the ester R prime. Let's say we use, let's say it was methanol. So we put the methanol here, then why not, since we still have a carbonyl, and we could certainly draw the curved arrows, why not add methanol again? It happens in the ketone case. So why don't we do, why didn't we do this? It happens just fine in the ketone case. Although the equilibrium really favors the ketone, but it still happens. It doesn't really even happen at all in the ester case. So what's different about the ester case? What does the ester lose in doing this? So this really doesn't happen. What does the ester lose in doing this that the ketone does not? Resonance, right? There's this nice, wonderful resonance that's here. And this causes it to go away. Here in the Fischer esterification, we lose the resonance in the intermediates, but we get it back. Here, we don't get it back. So just because there is a carbonyl does not necessarily mean the addition is favored. Aldehydes and ketones it is. If there is lone pairs next door that do resonance at equilibrium, usually the addition not favored. It's very, when this happens, it's very reversible. All right, so that's issue number one. Issue number two is another kind of pattern issue. And I keep harping on uh, thinking about these carbonyl mechanism steps in terms of patterns. Perhaps in looking at the reactions we've talked about last time and today, you may have noticed that there is another 
pattern in the kinds of steps that occur in carbonyl mechanisms. Now, what I mean by this is not I have a carbonyl, it can accept a nucleophile, etc. What I mean by this is if you take all the carbonyl mechanisms that we've done so far, and the Fischer serification and the imine formation are especially good places to look for this. You can take every single step that's in those mechanisms, every single one, and classify it in just one of three ways. So go back and look at the imine formation, go back and look at the Fischer esterification, see if you can think of those mechanism steps. And what we're saying here is every carbonyl mechanism that we do can be composed of just one of these three steps. Anybody have any ideas? Deprotonation, let's be one, just be a little bit broader than just deprotonation. Let's not, let's not discriminate against putting the protons on. Just proton transfer. That's one possibility. Not every step in the Fischer esterification or every step in the imine formation was a proton transfer. What other kinds of things were happening? The, very, the second step in Fischer esterification, not a proton transfer. What was that? It's the same as the first step, different reactants, but name-wise, the same thing as the first step in the imine formation mechanism. Yeah, nucleophilic attack at the carbonyl. Nucleophilic attack at carbonyl. Or for those of you who want to be PC, let's call that addition. Some people don't like attack. It sounds aggressive. You know, like the nucleophile is launching its missiles against the carbonyl or something. Three. Look at the Fischer esterification or the imine formation mechanism for the steps that are not proton on or proton off and that are not nucleophilic operation at the carbonyl. What's happening in the other steps? Leaving group leaving. What does it leave from? Carbon. What's the carbon part of? How many of you play charades? Longer term, more specific than just carbon. Ter it begins with a T, tetrahedral intermediate, right? So our third possibility is tetrahedral adduct, no chocolate, ejects, leaving group. Every single carbonyl mechanism step, regardless of whether it's addition or substitution, what the nucleophile is, whether it's Fischer serification, ester hydrolysis, imine formation, imine hydrolysis, addition of water to acetone, any of those, all three, every step can be described as one of these. So what this means is when you're putting together a carbonyl mechanism and you're stuck, these are your choices, that's it. If there's no carbonyl, then you either put a proton on, take a proton off, or have a tetrahedral intermediate fall apart. If there's no tetrahedral intermediate, then you're either putting a proton on, taking a proton off, or attacking that carbonyl. Third point. Last, this is something I want you to think about for Friday. In the Fischer esterification, we started the mechanism by protonating the carbonyl. In the imine case formation, we didn't. What I want you to think about is why do we have to do it in one case and not in another? And we're going to talk next time about catalysis of carbonyl mechanisms. That's where we will pick up with the lecture supplement on Friday. <laughs>